Okay, so here we go. We're going to talk a little bit about um, some issues I see as sort of coming in the next five years, some things going on right now. All from my seat in Washington, D.C. I sit in my chair, I look out to the left, there's the capital of the United States. Um, so I kind of have this inside the beltway Washingtonian um, perspective. Um, but I think you'll see that there's some issues here that I think cross over um, the, uh, the divide. Um, if you're interested, I'm on, I'm on social media. It's not very interesting. I never talk about movies or breakfast or anything like that. I just talk about higher ed. But if that is your thing, please feel free to follow me. Um, the good news today is this. I'm not ever going to mention this at all. Um, no <laughs> mentions of uh, this thing that is sweeping. I, you, I'm sure you're figuring out some way to connect this to freshman orientation or engagement week or something. Um, and um, my kids are all into it, but I'm not going to talk about that. Now, the last time I was on a campus uh, was towards the end of the semester in the spring. Um, and, and I'm going to, this next slide will show you a little bit about what I think many of you are feeling, right? Um, whoops. Um, and that is this. Um, that, like, this is hard work we do, right? It's really hard work. And by the end, and so it was, you know, everybody I talked to in student affairs I just was like, oh, I just can't wait for these students to get out of here. And now, of course, we're a little, bit, we're a little different, right? Now we're... <laughs> Which has to have the students are back, I, you know, there's all this excitement. Um, but I think it's important to sort of, you know, um, as we kind of pace ourselves through this and take a pause and reflect on what's going on in higher education and why are we so tired sometimes and why is the plate so full? Um, it's been, in the last five years, it's been a lot going on, you know, so um, we're not going to spend a lot of time in this, but clearly for everyone here in this room, whether you're in the counseling center, um, you're an academic advisor, res life, Greek life, doesn't matter. The issues around mental health are um, a big driver of the way in which we interact with students. Um, one of the things I consistently tell our student affairs colleagues as we think about the amount of resources we put into this and how important it is, it's both an important moral thing that we do to help our students succeed. But when we're talking to our business officers, I switch hats a little bit and say it's a retention issue because without the kind of wraparound services we provide all throughout the campus, many of the students wouldn't graduate and not, not be in a position to be able to participate uh, with a college degree. Obviously, sexual violence in Title IX continues. Um, I'm calling this sexual violence 2.0, that we've gotten past the, the mania uh, that we were after I, uh, April 2011 with the Dear Colleague letter um, in, in fixing, you know, repairing and tightening all of our policies and our conduct board hearings and, and all those pieces. And now we're left with the really hard work. And the really hard work is how do we change our campus, campus culture? How do we change the way in which um, these things can, can occur, what, what kinds of prevention efforts that we're going to employ that actually work. And this is going to be the really hard work. Um, what are we going to learn from campus climate surveys? What are we, how are we going to pro provide the appropriate support for our victims? And how do we maneuver this really tricky lane that we're in right now, which is providing appropriate victim support, um, um, but creating fair and balanced processes. And you can see this being played out all over the country. Um, the case in Colorado this week, um, earlier this summer, the case in Stanford. These are court cases, but they reflect really our nation's struggle with how to resolve and how to adjudicate these cases and how to um, create fair and equitable process. This is, we're not done with this. This will continue. And I think um, probably next, uh, next f maybe next spring, once the elections are over, uh, Claire McCaskill and Senator Gillibrand will probably re-submit re re uh, re uh, uh, the CASA, which is the next sexual assault legislation, which will have more requirements on higher ed. So that's a big issue. Alcohol and substance abuse continue to be um, you know, things that we struggle with. Um, we struggle with, if you've been around the field for a while, alcohol, we've struggled with alcohol for a while. The good news is we actually have seen some success in some of the most serious um, drinking um, behaviors among our students nationwide. We know more the science has gotten better. We know more about the kinds of things that actually work related to reducing high-risk drinking. Um, drug use is becoming um, another whole issue. Um, heroin's back. Um, in some parts of the world, country, methamphetamine, of course, is a big deal. Um, diversion of prescription stimulants is an issue. Opioid, opioid misuse. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, all these are issues. And then, of course, our nation is struggling with, or at least coming to terms with, what we think about marijuana. Given, given its legalization in some states, it's very difficult to, to tell our students when something's legal here, why you shouldn't do it here, and how can it be bad for you if it's legal? Um, and so this is something that we are um, struggling with. Uh, you might have seen that uh, um, uh, 
Department of Justice uh, did rule that, uh, that, that, that it is still federally illegal to use marijuana, even though some states are allowing it. Um, and it, we, one of the reasons we care about this is because what we know is two very simple things that are obvious to everyone in this room. That is this. The more times a month that you drink three to five times a night, and the more times you get high a month, your academic performance goes like this. So it just you can plot it um, uh, day by day. Um, and the reason is, the more times you get high, the more times you're drunk, um, the less you study, the less you go to class, the less time you put on task or academic interests. And so that there's, and, and that your likelihood for, this is a great word in higher education, for discontinuous enrollment, which basically means you dropped out, um, the likelihood of you dropping out increases. And so this is why we spend so much time on this. Again, a retention issue. So we can look at it as something we know as the health and wellness of our students, but it also has a very strong connection to the bottom line. Crisis management, suicide, gun violence, I mean, all this is another kind of piece that it falls in our laps as student affairs professionals. And, you know, Barb and Carrie and Scott and, and, and probably 10 other people in this room, you know, are, every night, you know, pay attention to what took place in the community in which you live here um, because of the impact it has. And, and sometimes it's horrific and sometimes it's just a more, a, a, occupy your day, but this kind of crisis management is a part of it. And the last thing is this sort of like the, the whole pact between how much it costs to go here, even as a state institution, and what you get on the back end, and the reality of the fiscal constraints that we're all going to operate under for the near future. Um, you know, it's been well documented that states all across the nation have, um, there's been a, a gradual disinvestment in higher education so that we are, we're not seeing a whole lot of new state dollars. And I, we can get salty about that if we want, but if we look at the state budgets, they're a mess also. Um, between health care and prisons, and infrastructure and energy and their own labor costs, there's not a lot left over. If you're a governor of a state and you take the pie, the, you know, the real pie of all the money you have to allocate, the amount that you actually have any discretion over is a little teeny piece. And so when things are hard, when we go through recessions or is downward pressure on taxes, you know, where are we? Well, it's, we're at the bottom. We're at the last, the last choice. It's K through 12, it's prisons, it's health care, and then, oh yeah, higher ed. And so we're not expecting a whole lot of new revenue to come into higher ed, and we can't raise tuition to, for the same kind of dollars we had. So we're looking at a protracted period of tight resources in the public sector in particular, higher, um, private sector as well, private education is struggling just as much. So when you put all that together, no wonder we're tired. So I'm gonna share with you um, a little video um, and introduce someone to you. It's, um, it's a little donkey um, that's called the Invention Donkey. Take it off. Whoa. Morning. What are you? They call me Invention Donkey. I grant invention wishes. Do I need to rub you or something? Do you want to rub me? No. Then just make a wish. Anything. Anything at all. I would uh, like two best friends. Okay. Understandable. Not invention. Oh. I only do invention. How about? DVDs. Been invented, okay? Come on, something that matters. How about an app? Like a fun app? You just ran into a little donkey that grants wishes. You want an app? Aim high. Okay. Something to help power the planet? Bingo. Close your eyes and clear your mind. Ready? Good. First, start planning this years ago. Build a massive network of think tanks, research and testing facilities. Hire brilliant people from all different arts and sciences. And pile on the PhDs. Getting all this? Yes. Right. Turn the large jobs of power to run cities on jet engine technology. And oh yeah, create data crunching windmills from the future. And then, poof, it's done. That sounds hard. Can somebody else do this? That sounds hard. Can't someone else do this? And this is my mantra for student affairs. This is hard. Can someone else do it? No, it's, it's you, it's us, it's us. And in fact, while over, those of you who've been in higher education for a while, we reflect back over the last decade or so sometimes, we often complain that people didn't value what we did or they didn't appreciate the value of what we provided the institution. And you know, I always joke that they looked out in the quad and they saw us blowing balloons up for the, you know, some kind of activities fair and like, oh, those are the balloons, those are the party people. No longer, no longer. We are now at the center of almost every significant issue facing your university and higher education. So I say to student affairs audience, this is our time. This is our time right now. We are at the center. We've got what we ask for. We're in the center of so many of the key issues facing American higher education. Um, 
So uh, when you think about the future, and you think, let's think about it had 10 years, which doesn't seem that long, that long ago, but when you think about what happened 10 years ago, you know, we had lost, just, you know, started 10 years ago, and has it been that long already? And wow, YouTube was founded. Think about the role that YouTube plays today in our children's lives. Um, Huffington, I mean, Facebook just expanded to high school, and Huffington Post just launched. I just saw Ariana Huffington is leaving the Huffington Post to start a new venture on health and wellness, but 10 years is not that long ago. So what's going to happen in the next 10 years is going to be very compact. We're going to see a lot of changes. I'm going to share with you some thoughts about how we're going to change in six charts. And the first is going to be hard to read. It's from the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It basically says, look, if we looked at American higher education as 100 students, what would we look like as an in industry? And I'm just going to point out a couple things which I think are really interesting. You know, one is full-time, part-time. We've got over a third of our students attending college part-time. Um, we have uh, almost 40% of our students in higher education on Pell Grants. Um, we have um, uh, full-time employment, almost a quarter, and part-time employment, over a third. So our students are increasingly working. We think everything's online, but 73% of our students are still basically taking classes in the classroom. And we have not revolutionized the whole learning enterprise yet. So um, this is really kind of an interesting thing. And we'll talk about age a little bit. People, you know, almost a quarter have children. Um, so the, we're looking at an enterprise that's very diverse. So when we talk about higher education, we think about it, we think about it, you oftentimes think about it, as traditional first-time, full-time students, 18 to 22 years old students. And that will always be the core of our business, you know, for two reasons. One is this is the coming of age generation. I mean, and so this generation um, largely will not seek higher education solutions that are going to be in their bedroom with you know, um, online learning exclusively. That will tend to be more for the adult learner. And Paul LeBlanc, who's the president of the University of Southern New Hampshire, who's one of the pioneers of online education in the country, when talking about this coming of age generation and the future of higher education, he said, well, yeah, we'll have online learning, but we're still going to have the U and other places like it for lots of reasons, but, his, but one of them he believes is because parents want their kids the hell out of the house. Um, and I think there's, there's a truth to that as well. Um, and so the, the combination of this is, is that I'm not pessimistic about the future of brick and mortar institutions because we will always have this core population. All right, second slide. This is well documented. All you admissions people in the room know this, that we had this great run up all the way up to 2008-9 in, in a number of students graduating from high school. We knew it was going to dip. We weren't as prepared as we could have been because we were talking about it for a decade. And then it dipped, and we just got through the bottom of that dip, which is great. Um, because during that dip, we saw an increasing number of institutions, not the U, but other institutions in different parts of the country, suffering from not either meeting their enrollment or their revenue goals. And as an industry, we've actually um, become much less fiscally sound. In 2009, 85% of American higher education institutions had net revenue of 5% or more. So net revenue means basically you're bringing more money than you're spending. And in the, in the world of education, higher education, if you don't have net revenue, where are you going to get the money? You're going to have to get it from your reserve or your endowment. And so it's just not a, it's not a sustainable uh, mode of, of, of survival. That's why Sweetbriar College was going was to close, because they were tapping into their endowment to make their bills. So 85%, 5% or larger in 2009. Today, only 10% of American institutions have net revenue of 5% or above. So the fiscal environment has changed. Some of that's driven by the challenges, particularly in the Midwest and the Northeast, in this declining enrollment. Now, the good news is we're on the back up. We go back up again. And in about 10 years, we go back down again. This is all the baby boom getting played out um, over and over again. And baby boomlet, baby boomlet, baby boomlet gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and, but we never get back to where we were in the, in the go-go years. We never get back to a, a, a rising, and, and we know that, right? Because we know who has been, who's born. The thing about demographics is like this is that the, the, the young babies that were born today, in 18 years from now, are going to go to college. We already know who they are. And so we know 18 years from now what the entire demographics are going to look like for higher education. And it's not a period of growth. It's a period of basically being flat. Now, it depends on where you live. Um, to where um, how you, this has the most effect. If you're in the Midwest or in the Northeast, you have actually between an 8 and 10% decrease in the next decade in high school graduations. Out in the West and in the border states in the South, and actually Utah as well because of some of the birth rates in some of the sectors in, in, in Utah, you actually are seeing increases. 
But what's going to happen is we're going to see uh, more and more competition. So what, what we're going to see is the sort of these red states are places where there actually increases in high school graduation, and you see these states have a decrease. These states are not going to sit around and go out of business. They're going to come after your students. And so the competition for students is getting more and more intense, and that's one of those realities. And you can see the border states where we have larger Hispanic Latino populations with higher birth rates. Up here we have large, larger populations of white non-Hispanics. They have babies at a lower rate. That's just the way it is. Now, as a result of that, up, up north, we have lots of competition. You know, you got billboards in Connecticut saying, go to Maine. And we have all this kind of people fighting for the same group of students. And the concentric circle around which we are recruiting is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Admissions directors last year, in last year's survey, 51% said they did not meet, were not going to meet their enrollment goals for this coming this last year. Um, and then 58% said they did not meet their goals. And these stat so Stacy's a stats person, so um, there's a little statistical thing here. Don't you want to meet the 70% of the people who didn't meet their goals but aren't concerned about it? Uh, and most in the private sector think it's because of student debt, that the perceptions of affordability are driving people's decisions to go either to college at all or to four-year colleges. All right, third chart. I mentioned those young people. So here's a, a look at what is going to look like higher education. 18 to 24-year-olds in 2022, we will still have 13.6 million students in the 18 to 22-year-old demographic compared to much less in the older demographic. Now, if you read the news sometimes in higher ed news, you might think, oh, the whole world's being taken over by adult learning. In fact, it's not the case. We'll still be predominantly an enterprise um, that will be of 18 to 20-year-olds. And so, it's, so for anybody who's a young professional in the room, this is good news. I think there'll be a job for you later on. Um, this is a good thing. Um, and that we will uh, maintain sort of the basic structure of higher ed. What's going to happen? We will see some more mergers. We'll see more private institutions, real small privates merging with each other, going out of business. More consortiums of institutions. Instead of having five libraries in the same rural community and three personnel offices and three technology offices, you'll see institutions trying to find efficiencies that way. We'll see that kind of uh, movement. OK, fourth chart. After something you already know, um, uh, and that is that we as a country and a nation are becoming more diverse racially and ethnically. So this is against 2004 data. By 2022, we'll see about a 90% increase in um, students graduating from high school. This is graduation from high school of students, uh, Latino, Hispanic students graduating from high school. 90% increase. During that same time period, we'll have about a 13% decrease in white, non-Hispanic youth graduating from high school. Now, this is just part of where we're heading as a nation. Because by, as you may know, by 2040, as a nation, we will become minority majority. Okay, we'll have more um, uh, residents and, and US citizens of color than we will have white, non-Hispanic residents. That's a huge change. Now, the good thing is our campuses are going to be increasingly more diverse. And that's going to create all kinds of um, amazing learning opportunities for us um, to create that kind of intercultural, interracial um, uh, learning opportunity for our students. But along the way, we're going to have some struggles. And we see this also. We see this in um, you know, every time you open up a newspaper. Um, how students are pushing back against issues on their campus about racial injustice and how Black Lives Matter is on campus and how people are paying the graduation rates. All this stuff's happening. And so we're going to have both things happening at the same time. Now, Utah is a little pretty, uh, I'm not sure about Utah's diversity as a state, but you're, not, you're very close to the West. So if you go to California, you will see what America will look like in 20 years. Um, California is already there. They're already a minority majority state. And that movement is going west to east. Um, until our whole nation will be that way. But um, the real key issue here is, as we look at the significant interest increase in Hispanic Latino youth, is that those students are disproportionately low income, disproportionately first generation, and come from school districts with less resources, and get, come to us often with challenges in college-ready math and English skills. And that's one of the challenges. So the largest growth of population is also the population that we know we are struggling with in terms of how we provide academic success. Um, we know that remediation, for example, has been a total failure um, in higher education to bring young, low-income, first-gen students in, put them in remedial English and math classes, um, and then find out that they, seeing no progress in their degree, they drop out. Um, and so we're making progress in understanding what is it that helps these students be successful. I'll talk more about that. The other thing is that as a nation, 51% of students in public high schools are low-income. First time ever in the United States we've had that. And if you look at that chart, 
that looks like a lot like the chart about birth rates um, and high school graduation. The southern states and the border states and, the, and west are states where we have higher proportions um, of low-income students. In these red states, it can be as over, it's over 50 percent. Up in the plains um, and in the northeast, we have some lower. Utah's uh, above 59 percent. So, you know, think about how this all comes together. So the students that are going to be recruiting to come to this place that is already perceived to be unaffordable, increasingly are low income. And we know some things about low-income students, about where they go and how they enroll, I'll share later, but that, this is going to be one of the challenges going forward. There's just not enough high-income, high-talent students to go around. We're going to have to be dipping into um, populations of students and making for, uh, college affordable for a whole different segment of, pop, of students. And the last chart is about two-thirds of college students are, are first generation. Now, that will change, of course, as we move in as a nation, but right now, um, we have a lot of first-gen students at Utah and everywhere else um, that makes up our student body, and that has some challenges to it. So that, in an aggregate, describes where we're going as an industry, and so there's some things, some flags out there that concern us because all these are going to be challenges for us going forward. Now, one of them is this. Everybody in higher education is talking about this. If you're in a foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is talking about it, Lumina is talking about it, Ford is talking about it, ACT is talking about it, the Department of Education is talking about it, Obama is talking about it, and NASPA is talking about it. Um, that we have got to do something about this national embarrassment, and that is we have been, as an industry, so poor in graduating first-gen students of color, low-income students, um, and this, that disparity is creating really two different societies in America. One, if you have resources and largely are white, you have access to the best colleges and universities. If you're of color, low income, first gen, you tend to go um, either not into college at all um, or to a different set of institutions. And that is a um, concern as we think about our country. So a couple of stats. You've seen some of this before. If you're in the lower quartile, the lower 25% of income, your chance of getting a college degree by the age of 24 is 9%. That's pretty low. If you're in the upper quartile, it's 77%. That should make us, as a country, feel a little uncomfortable that income is driving access to the benefits of a college education, which are significant. Same thing for first gen. Three out of five first gen students don't get a degree in six years. We'll talk a little bit more about why that is, but you know, um, that, that's, that's an issue. Now, when we think about first gen and low income, those of you who, in, who travel in this know there's some think it's called intersectionality. There's a, the, these things intersect. And they intersect along race and ethnicity in particular. So as we think about this, this is the Lumina data, we see that we have this kind of completion data for our, for our country around race. The Lumina Foundation and the Gates Foundation and, and Obama all said by 2020 we want to have 60% of the American public will have a college degree or a high quality certificate, 60%. This is where we are with whites, 44%. So even on whites, we're not there yet. Um, and our nation needs more people who are college educated. Now, all these numbers are at historic levels. Those are the highest numbers we've ever seen as a nation. That's encouraging. We're making progress in graduating more students, uh, African American students, Latino students, Native American students. Um, um, but what's happened, though, is the gap between white completion and African American, Native American, and, um, uh, and Latino is getting bigger. Okay, so we're actually, the problem is getting worse. Um, there's a great report that I won't read this um, um, called Separate But Unequal from Georgetown that essentially says, hey, look, we've got, we're, we got two different educational systems that are occurring here. And look at this data here. Um, even among smart students, 57% of, of black and Latino students with a 1,200 or higher, which is pretty good. SAT, you're probably higher here, your average is probably higher here, but still bright students receive a two or four year degree. 77% of white students do, so there's an attainment gap. So the same academic quality, same academic preparation, and you can argue about the SAT, but the, the principle here is we're seeing this. But here's the one that scares me the most. Between 95 and 2009, 82% of new white freshmen were at 468 of the most selected four year colleges. During that same time period, the vast majority of Hispanic, Latino, and African American, their track was at open access and two-year colleges. And so we have a very clear bifurcation of what's happening in our, in our country. The Hispanic, Latino, 
black African American students are ending up in institutions. Nothing wrong with those institutions, but they're not going to have the same economic job opportunities, the same internship opportunities, the same um, study abroad opportunities, all the things that are happening over there. For the, so this is, again, a, a, so an issue for us as a country. So the challenge is, how do we do about this? We, we have to have the will, as institutions, to do something we ha have not done before. And, that's something that's, and, and it means doing something that's not in our self-interest. Because our institutional self-interest is to, is to bring in the smartest, most talented students who have the most money um, that probably helps our US and Earth World Report ranking. And that's in our self-interest. What's not in our self-interest is to look more broadly at this as an industry and as a country and say, we need to do something about how we are bringing students in. Now, there's two aspects of this. One is bring them in, and the second thing is graduate them. So let's talk about the graduation. So for low-income first-generation students, we know they tend to enroll in fewer hours. Of course they do. They're more part-time. They tend to be less involved in things that we call social capital. They don't have the, the, the natural ability to maneuver our systems, understand our engagement opportunities, join a club or organization. Um, they have a difficult time understanding services. And I can tell you for sure, as a parent of an incoming freshman, I spent so much time on the University of Maryland website trying to figure this thing out. And I, I got a PhD. I work in higher ed. I'm the president of NASPA. <laughs> I was like, what chance would a parent who, who, who has never even thought about college would have to get through that system? It's scary. Um, kids balance lots of different multiple roles. They're expected to work. Um, and their families don't understand why they can't work more and provide more su uh, support. And, the, and just in general, we need more family support. If you're, who's our, anybody in orientation here? Raise your hand, orientation. Okay, so your orientation people. We joke about this, not funny, but we joke about the helicopter parents, right? You know, all these parents, they sit in the advising session, we can't get rid of them and all that kind of stuff. And we kind of joke about the, maybe they're bulldozer parents, maybe they're helicopter parents. But for our low income first generation students, as you guys know, the problem isn't over-involvement, it's no involvement. Again, it's my own personal experience. Went to parent orientation on a Wednesday. I spent the whole day. I can do that. I'm, I got paid. I got, I, took a, I, mean, I got a day off. But if you're a low-income family, $25,000 or less, you can't take the day off orientation. So even the way in which we interact with our parents and our families have to be rethought a little bit. Um, now, work is a huge determinant of success, one way or the other. If students don't work, their completion rate is about 17%. Well, of course, low-income students, first-gen students, needing more resources, they're just simply not going to be able to afford to be here. But if they work more than 20 hours because they have an even greater need, it goes down to 14%. Why is that? They can't engage. They can't spend time studying. They can't connect. There's no social, there's no, none of this, all of the beneficial things that take place. So we know is this. We know this number right here is the sweet spot. Huge difference, 1 to 20 hours. When many of our low-income first-gen students work, um, work one to 20 hours, where are they working? They're working at the U. So that's a, that is this expanding the amount of on-campus employment um, creates more and more engagement opportunities, more connection, more support, more opportunities for developing that social capital. It's a, it can be a very strong um, determinant of success. Now, the good news is we know a lot about actually how to help students succeed in this space. Um, when President Obama, two years ago, did his State of the Union address, he talked about the CUNY ASAP program, ASAP, um, for about 800 students. They provided uh, subway fare. They, bought, they got book, book, book money. Um, they had a coach. They had a mentor, learning community. Um, they did all this stuff with them. And their success ratio went up from like, like a 20% completion rate to like 80%. It's like, wow, we found the magic sauce. 800 students at CUNY. CUNY registers 500,000 students. Most of them are low-income first generation. So our problem isn't necessarily what to do, it's how do we scale it? How do we make it from the boutique, small, 20 students at a time, to doing it in more growth? Because the things that we know work are this, personal contact, mentoring, coaching, intrusive or proactive advising. We know those kind of personal contacts make a big difference. Now, Barb probably heard me say this before, but I think about student affairs. We are really good at specialization. And, I, and all of you have a specialization. You know, Wit's a lifetime union guy. That's what he's doing. Union, orientation, it's conduct. We have all these, you know, who's our res life? Where's our res lifer? So you're probably too busy to even be here. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're moving, yeah. I'm glad you're not here. <laughs> um, I think we need to think of student affairs moving towards a place of more generalist behavior, more generalist skill building. Um, eventually, I would like to see a place where if we, because there's not enough academic advisors, right? The ratio of an academic advising is like 100 to 1, 150 to 1, 200 to 1. There's not, these, the, you're, this, that's not the solution. 
So if we're going to provide this kind of contact, we're going to have to find um, new folks to do this. So as we either reorganize, or what if we thought about student affairs professionals, as um, many who, of whom could have a portfolio of low-income first-gen students that they coach and mentor. And if we're really rocking it, you would actually have access to the academic advising degree progress software. That's a whole other thing. Got to convince a whole bunch of people that's going to be a good idea. But, but minimally, that kind of coaching and mentoring can happen. Engagement's huge. We know clear connection between engagement um, and success for these for students like this. Um, and, and big one, career and progress towards degree. They have to see that the time they're on campus when they're not working, that they're actually making real progress towards something that looks like a degree. Um, and so that kind of degree progress is also really important. And we have to reduce financial barriers. Pell is not enough um, for the most part. So we have to think creatively about how we can provide opportunities for students for things like uh, books and some other kinds of expenses um, you, that you have. We're, we've been studying emergency um, aid programs where you know small two, three, four hundred dollar crises is the difference between a student being enrolled and not enrolled. Those kinds of things. That's the kind of thinking we're going to need to do. It really it's going to mean a really and over time a rethinking of the way in which we approach um, uh, working with students in some ways. So, and now this. So, what, so on top of all that stuff we got to worry about and all those other things I talked about earlier, our campuses are blowing up around student activism. Um, Black Lives Matter is on many of our campuses. Um, students are really pushing back against systemic oppression and, and issues in the classroom and what they see as um, uh, uh, racial injustice on our campuses. So what's going on here? Because this was not the case five years ago. In fact, We've been begging students to get active <laughs> for like uh, two decades. And all they care about was parking and food. Um, and suddenly, you know, they're, they're sitting on the president's step. What happened here? Well, a couple of things are going on. First of all, these are, so who are these people? These are not millennials. We have a bunch of millennials here. It's not, it's not you guys. It's actually the next generation. It's Gen Z that's doing this. Um, Gen Z already is the largest generation. We're going to be with them for a while. And they are much more activists. They're much more involved. Um, than we've ever seen before. They're, uh, they learn differently. So for this generation, it's all about the video. It's about five minute, two minute, three minute videos. This is the DIY generation. Talk to your teenagers that you might have. This is how they learn. This, they're going to be pushing us, because this is not how we teach. But this is the way they learn. Even more so than the um, millennials. Um, they're using YouTube and, and video learning like this. They're more active. They've been involved in community service at the high school level. They're more activist. Um, they, if you interview them, they say they want to change the world. They, first of all, they know that we screwed it up. They will just say that. And they know that it's kind of on them to fix it. And they're, kind of, they're up for that task. But there's that kind of uh, viewpoint. I consider them the freestyle generation. So I assume you have freestyle Coke machines in Utah. Not every state has them. West Virginia doesn't have them yet. Um, I was there last week, uh, a couple weeks ago, and they don't have them. This is a machine, as you know, you go and you get all kinds of different combinations of soda. So when I take my son, who's 18, and my daughter, who's 16 or 15, she's 15 right now, and we go to Noodles and Company, which is where our Coke machines are. And I go first, because I'm going to be simple. I'm going to go up to the Coke machine and get a Coke. I'm getting a Coke. But my daughter comes after me, and she's going to get some combination of 15 different things. And Coca-Cola is smart. Coca-Cola understands that young people in this generation want to create their own experience. They want to be architects of lots of things in, different, in ways that we've never seen before. And that's part of why they're pushing us. Look at this data from Northeast. Northeastern University, they surveyed about 25,000 um, Gen Z uh, students. 70, almost 3 quarters want, that when they go to college, they want their, to be able to design their own major. What? We're not ready for that. I, we might have a couple of independent studies, but we're not going to really let them design their own major. Really? But 63% of them want to be learning about business and entrepreneurship. They all want to be Elon Musk, who's the founder of Tesla. That's what they want. They all think that they can be the next dot-com revolution. They want to work for themselves. They don't work for people. They want to work for companies. You know, they used to be the other way around. Now they all want to work because this is the generation. So, so this is going to push us also. And they're incredibly socially liberal. So look at how they view social issues. 75% everyone should have the right to marry regardless of sexual orientation. Transgender people should have equal rights. 83% healthcare free forever. This, does that look a lot like Bernie Sanders platform a little bit here? Um, everyone should have the right to become a citizen. 63%. It's a very liberal, socially just oriented generation. Um, and um, wow, you're going to see this play out on our college campuses this political season when we see um, the Trump-Clinton thing come to light. Um, 
Um, but th but this, so this liberalism, this social justice orientation, is also how they're pushing our institutions. We can see where they're getting this from. So campus protest and activism. Let me talk about something, one example of how I think it's useful to look at this. So the Pew Charitable Trust, which is a um, an organization has done some work over the last uh, several years about asking American citizens about race in America. Two questions they ask. Our country has made the changes needed to give blacks equal rights. Our country needs to continue making changes. So the blue line, we've made the changes. This would be sort of the post-racial view of America. Oh, we're pretty much there. Everything's good. We kind of moved past all this racial stuff. And the red line is, ah, we're not there yet. Okay, we see, see we're kind of a little about half on the blue and a little less than half in the red. And then suddenly, things flip around. Now we have a majority of America thinking we've got more work to do. Well, what happened? Ferguson and Baltimore. Huge, iconic events in our country that had um, an effect on how we began to see each other in our country so that this thing flipped. Now this is interesting, but it's even more interesting when we disaggregate whites and blacks in America in the same re research. When we take whites, we see that we are a much higher rate of folks thinking we were post-racial, believing that we had made all the changes necessary, and fewer people thinking we needed to can, can make the changes. Still reversed, but now look at this, and now look at how blacks looked at America at the same time period. Same time period, we had a much significantly higher percentage of blacks in America thinking we need to continue to make changes. We're, we're very few thinking that we had already made those changes. That is also what we see on our campuses. Our students of color see your campus in a very different way than maybe you have thought they saw it. And we're discovering that, and unfortunately, we're surprised by it. And that surprise is actually creating some of the discord. I don't think we had heard the voices of many of our students in the classroom and how they were experiencing our residence halls and the, just the general environment of our campuses. And that is part of what's happening today. Those voices are getting heard. Um, and I think it's useful as we think about what's, what's happening. So last thing I want to share about data on this thing is that when NP, MTV surveyed students, 73% believe we should speak more openly about bias, which is good. That's a very, they want it, and it's not surprising. But only 20% say they're comfortable doing so. So we have the majority of our students who actually don't feel very comfortable with these messy, uncomfortable conversations about race or gender or gender identity and all the entire spectrum. So one of our important jobs as student affairs professionals is creating that space. Create the space for these uncomfortable dialogues because if we can't do it here, we certainly can't expect to do it in the McDonald's or in the workplace or anywhere else in our country. So this, this work we're doing around racial injustice and all this, I think, is as vitally important for our country to provide the skill set and the competency that we can begin to move forward a little bit. But in the midst of all that, we're going to have a lot of protest. And we have 77 campuses that have demands about a variety of things. I'm not going to go into them here. But just maybe, you know, so if you've been around higher ed, it's like, what, is it just the students that changed? Isn't this kind of like the 60s? No big deal. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, the biggest change is social media. Social media has changed everything about activism because suddenly what happens locally, it becomes national. Um, and I mean, and, uh, and uh, uh, students who are activists on campus are not just talking to each other in the U. They're talking to Utah State, and they're talking to USC, and they're talking to Stanford, and they're talking to Berkeley, because they're all connecting around strategy. What worked for you? Oh, take over the president's office. That works. Do a hunger strike. They're connecting around strategy, and that is part of what's changed. The other thing that's changed is that even the students who are activists on our campus aren't necessarily the Black Student Union, the Latino Student Union, GBTQ Center. There may be students who are just speaking out and forming loose alliances and creating um, activism on our campus. The challenge with that is we don't know those students. Or we may not know them in the same way. We don't have the same kind of relationships with those students. And so that's been challenging. And the last thing is this. As a leader today, Barb's role, the, um, your president, how quickly you say something, what you say, um, everything, all this matters. That, that, that the old way was if something happens on campus, no matter what it was. All right, we're going to write a letter to the community. All right, let's get the communication staff involved. Let's get the advancement staff involved. Let's think about our image and our brand. Um, let's, let's process all that kind of stuff. And, and maybe several days later, we'll come out with some kind of letter or something like that. Now, if you don't respond within two hours, um, you will be critiqued for that. Um, and, so, and how you say it and how quickly you say it now matters more than ever. We're in a very challenging situation from college leadership. And I'll share with you that, I don't know about here, but college presidents I interact with are a little frightened and they're afraid to say the wrong thing or to say it the wrong way. And they're, and they're worried about the kind of this activism that's boiling up. And they're looking to their vice president of student affairs and saying, can you be out there for me? <laughs> can you take the heat? <laughs> 
And usually that works, but a lot of students, students are savvy. The student, the students, oh no, we don't want Barb out there. We want the president. We already know Barb's on the right team. We want the, we want to hear the president. We want to hear that leadership voice. So it's going to be interesting times coming up. Other issues. I'm going to skip this. Oh, you know, let me just say one more thing here. Very important, I think, as a, as a profession that we acknowledge and recognize for the, for the um, uh, staff of color in the room and in the Division of Student Affairs, the kind of racial battle fatigue that many of you feel, that you are always on the, asked to do this job and how tiring it can be. Um, I hear that over and over again from, um, from staff. And the second thing is, for all of you, particularly the young people in the room, it is not easy to maneuver. There's no simple answer to whether or not you can be angry about something, and can you express that anger? Can you be an activist on your own campus? If your students are rising up, can you be right there with them? And there's no easy answer to this question, because it's complicated, right? I mean, you definitely don't want to be on the president's steps, calling for his resignation, and be in the paper. OK, no, that's easy, right? That's easy. That's we don't want your picture. X person, Division of Student Affairs, calling for the president's resignation. That's not, we know that one's easy. But that long, there's a whole bunch of other things we don't know about. And, and I got no answers for you other than to say that I know that young professionals are struggling with this. Can I have my own voice and still be an institutional representative? And that's something you have to, we have to talk about that. That's something we have to, let's also acknowledge that Black Lives Matter is here. It's on your campus. It's on every campus and an important part of the conversation we're having about racial injustice. But Islamophobia, gender identity issues, Latino issues, undocumented student issues, there's a lot of other identities that are going to be wrapped up in this activism. So we need to kind of pay attention to all that. OK, um, let me just not get political, but just say, because uh, it's just not about whether I, we're going to vote for Trump, but he's, he is saying some things that we know our students are going to react to. And this is a chalking from Emory University. And the students at Emory University um, chalked Trump as a Trump supporter on there, which is part of their First Amendment right. Um, but many um, of students on, uh, at Emory's campus experience that as a microaggression. That's really hard to resolve, isn't it? First Amendment, not feeling safe. And I think we're going to see a lot of that in this next uh, election cycle. So for those of you who struggle in this area, I just say this, and particularly as a white person of privilege, how I come to this is I'm just learning. I'm trying to learn just like everybody else. And I think this quote means a lot to me, which is just do the best you can until you know better and then do better. I mean, that's really what we have to continue to do. And we have to have enough grace, at least within student affairs, to have the, heart, the conversations and let us ourselves struggle with this. Because it's not, some, for some of you, it's, you're new to it, and some of you are experienced at it, and you come to different places. Let's have the grace to allow ourselves to have that conversation. So let me sh shift gears here a little bit um, and just share a couple things in closing. College is changing. And I love this little girl. She's a, a first grader. New York Times did an article about college, and she, they interviewed little kids. And this one's my favorite one. You know, what's college? She said, it's like, it's like high school, but it's higher. It's so simple. It, was, it seems it would be that easy. But there's some things, interesting things happening in higher education. And one of them I just want to comment on is competency-based education. You know, by 2020, they're saying about 750 colleges, half a million students will have beginning competency-based education credits. And what this basically means is if you know something, and I can demonstrate that I know it, a discipline, on a, in a math or English or any kind of discipline, can I get credit for it without having to sit in a classroom for 16 weeks? Now, our traditional model is you sit in a classroom 16 weeks, and then you take a test, a serious test, and you get a grade, and then you get your credits. But what if I know it already? What if I know it from previous life experience? What if I was in Afghanistan for four years, and I know things that I can take a test about? What if I'm willing to put the time into a MOOC, a massive open online course, in my living room at some reduced cost, and I can take a test, can I get credit for that pre-calc course? And the answer is yes. More and more colleges are, are both experimenting with this and allowing it. Now, largely, this is an adult learner kind of model. Um, but if you look at dual enrollment, AP credits, and now competency-based education, we're going to see a movement, I think, in the next decade towards more three-year degrees. We always thought about college as being a four-year degree, but we started accumulating these credits in this way. We're going to see alternative ways of getting a college degree that are going to challenge us. First of all, it challenges us financially because we're counting on all four of those years. We're not going to pay the same amount of money for that course there. Um, but the thing I think we should, we're going to have to grapple with is we're losing the freshman year because now these students are coming in as sophomores with sophomore credits. 
Um, and you know, in the basic advising process, we're asking them to make major decisions early, um, and usually that freshman year is a period of experimentation. That's certainly one thing. And if more students kind of opt out of the freshman year in different alternative um, ways, we, we depend on the freshman year to teach them everything. I mean, the curriculum and orientation is just, I mean, you know how packed it is? I know you know this. Every minute counts, right? You've got all this stuff. We've got Title IX, we've got to do this, we've got that, we've got all this stuff we've got to cram in. So I worry about that a little bit. And in places like Arizona State, which are experimenting with using online education to bend the cost curve of higher ed. So this Global Freshman Academy, what they do basically is this. Your freshman year, you take entirely through MOOCs. You only pay for the course when you complete it. And at the end of that, you get your freshman year done. Then you enter as a regular Arizona State University freshman. Your degree says Arizona State, not ASU online, ASU. What they've done here is for low-income students, essentially, is made it less uh, costly in their freshman year. Interesting experiment. They had tens and tens of thousands of students take them up on this this last year. Now, a very small percentage of students completed it. So you might think failure. But it's too early in the experimentation process. I think we're going to see campuses looking at lots of different ways they can expand their student population um, to become more economically viable. And I'm just going to mention those. So, but for us, technology and student affairs has some different challenges. There's something called, or some people worry about, the unbundling of student affairs. Can we cost out different segments um, and make it more affordable. Um, so um, uh, this TAO online actually was founded by Sherry Benton at the University of Florida. It's a, actually it's a University of Florida funded activity and it provides low level therapeutic intervention um, in an online environment. Now most counseling psychologists will tell you you can't do this. But even the counseling profession is sort of beginning to open itself up to this a little bit. So these things like this allow us to think differently about the provision of services. Here's another company, Prevail, which has been doing a ton of online counseling for returning vets um, and with, with a lot of success. Um, companies like Kuru um, provide, for a fee-for-service, um, internships and job placement and a whole, basically what your career development office does um, because there's some, you know, they, they think they can do it better than you. And before LinkedIn was bought by Microsoft, which kind of killed LinkedIn, I think, but before that, LinkedIn strategically wanted to be your career development office. That, that, that is, they were totally positioning themselves in that direction. So there is some worry for us about you know, how some of this might be unbundled. But for the most part, I think you know, there's two things I would say. If you've ever heard Eric Stoller talk, who's a technologist in student affairs, he will tell you, and that's what I agree with, is that we have to use the same technology our students use. The students are spending 18, 24 hours, 30 hours a week online. We have to be where they are. We have to have the same, that competency. Now, it's a lot easier for you younger professionals, but we have to think about engagement in a much broader way than we have before. It's not just showing up to the union and shaking Wit's hand. I have to actually engage, I can engage with Wit online and have a, nah, nah, forget that part. Bad example. Um, so, um, you know, can we build community? Can we, can we expose students to diverse perspectives? Can we do some of these same kinds of things? Can we have a, a, a rich interaction between online and live learning? There's a great book um, by Sherry Turkle called Alone Together, which creates a real challenge for us. And that Alone Together basically says this. Young people are so mm, connected to this that they're losing the ability to have meaningful dialogue with each other. Um, and I think this is never going away. So maybe in student affairs and our curriculum, it's how we provide the mixture of the two and that, and that richness. So everything we do live has real value because we're kind of reinforcing a skill set that's going to be important for them as they move on. So let me finish this, this last thing. We need more college students. Everybody says the same thing. By 2025, we need about 11 million more college students than we otherwise are going to graduate. That's why all this retention and completion stuff is important. We know the students are coming to us with a very different mindset about college. In 1971, three quarters of the students said they come to college to develop a meaningful purpose, a meaning of life. And most of them weren't really about the you know, third off well financially. In 2011, it was the opposite. 80% want to be well off financially, and that probably number is even greater now. So we have this return on investment transactional expectation that our students have now. So we have to, we have to acknowledge that. It's real. It costs a lot to be here. And they should try to get a job. Uh, and that's what their families want. So we have to acknowledge that part of it. But we also have to acknowledge that what really matters is this. Um, yeah, I'm going to make a lot more money. This is the wage premium for being in college. This is a community college. This is not having college. You know, today, the unemployment rate in the United States is, anybody know? 
you know, I'm reading the Wall Street Journal, yeah, 4.7%, which is historically almost what's considered full employment. You almost can't get any lower than that. Do you know what it is if you have a high school degree and no more than that? 17%. So now you make more money, your job, your job prospects are, um, are different. And so while that's an important dimension, we also have to acknowledge that, that um, when we talked about the real value of the education, that most employers care more about the acquisition of these skills than they do actually about the major or the university you went to. Now I put dreaded soft skills up here because we hate, in the United States we hate, hate the word soft skills. It doesn't, uh, in Europe, that's all they use, soft skills. But we're really talking about non-cognitive skills, 21st century skills, social and emotional skills. What we're talking about is this, the fact that in, when you survey employers, 95% of them will say what we most care about are these cross-cutting skills, leadership skills, the critical thinking, communication skills, innovation, um, ethical judgment, ability to deal with all that package of things which comes right out of the student affairs curriculum. This is what we do. This is why we do it. Every interaction we have with a student, whether it's in res life or Greek life or advising or career development or any, all across the spectrum, whether you're a RD or you're working the line in food services, you are, this is what you're doing. You help students developing these skill sets. And I think that that's increasingly going to be important for us and also centers us as student affairs professionals in the real important work that the institution is doing. So, you know, I talked about that list earlier. I think that one of the big concerns I have is that student affairs, yeah, we're now central, but we're central for the wrong reasons. Who wants to be known for the folks dealing with crisis all the time? So, I wrote this article in the Association and Governing's Board, or a magazine called Trusteeship uh, last year called Don't Just Call Us in a Crisis. And that really gets at the fundamental thing. Yes, we are the ones to call when things go bad. But we're also providing important um, work, on all that achievement gaps I've talked about. Student affairs is not the only player, but we certainly are a key player with our academic colleagues in that space. All the work we're doing in civic engagement, all the work we do in trying in leadership and developing these key competencies are the non-crisis things that in some ways are the most important things that we do. So I actually don't think we need an invention donkey, because we have student affairs. Um, and <laughs> I'm really, uh, and really, seriously, I, you know, when I go out and travel to campuses, I am so enthousi enthusiastic and bullish on the future of higher education because of you people and the commitments that you make every day in the lives of students and this, um, for their success and their well-being. Um, and it makes me very hopeful about um, the work we're going to do. So thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure being back to the U.